Welcome back to a Monday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Take Tech Hawaii. And we're joining not one, but two guests, uh, while well, one contributor, Russell Liu and uh, Paul Anderson, Judge Paul Anderson, both in Minnesota. Uh, well, actually, Russell is here in Hawaii. Just checking that out. And Judge Anderson is in Minnesota because he's a retired judge in Minnesota for the Minnesota Supreme Court. How do you like that? Yes. I'm going to. So Russell. I'm going to walk in just a minute here. Is that, you know, the title for my position is justice. But the easy way to refer to me is just a uh, judge, because I tell people justice is more of a concept. It doesn't roll easily off the tongue as the title. So go ahead and say, refer to me as judge. Okay, Russell, gonna, Russell will say that. justice, I'm sure. Well, we'll see you in a moment. Russell, what would you say? And can you introduce the judge? Uh, can you introduce the subject of our discussion today? Because I'm the youngest guy, Jay, I'm going to call Paul Justice Anderson, out of respect. But but I good morning to our audience in Hawaii. And good morning to or good afternoon to our audience out in the Midwest and wherever you may be. Um, today we have a really uh, special opportunity to have Justice Paul Anderson or Judge Anderson uh, to uh, share and enlighten us about his experiences uh, teaching American jurisprudence around the world. Um, he's been esteemed uh, Supreme Court Justice for the Supreme Court of Minnesota for over two decades. And um, for the past few years, he's been invited by many prestigious law schools and institutions around the world. He's lectured and taught in Russia, China, Philippines, and many other places, um, uh, which he can share about lecturing. You forget American one of my big failures, Libya. <laughs> oh, Libya too. So he's been everywhere. And so I think um, Jay will have a lot of questions too, uh, because it's a fascinating experience. Um, what's it like to lecture American jurisprudence to law students and to young lawyers abroad? And why is it important and relevant in today's global context? Wow. Thanks for, the, thanks for that discussion, Russell. So, uh, Judge, Judge Paul, I, I want to ask you one question. You served 20 years on the bench as a Supreme Court justice uh, in Minnesota, and then you spent another, well, several years, almost 10 years, I guess, um, running around the world and trying to explain American jurisprudence um, to people everywhere, really. Which was a better time in your life? Ah, a Sophie's Choice, if you don't remember that movie. Uh, I really enjoyed my time on the court. And I got to be frank with you, I'm a, I was a better judge of justice than I was a lawyer. It just really uh, uh, fit into my talents and my skills and what I wanted to do. Uh, we have mandatory retirement, Minnesota, age 70, could be age 72. I don't disagree with that concept. Maybe it should have been 72. Uh, but uh, what I've done afterwards has uh, also been fulfilling. I do still do a lot of mentoring of students. I'm doing some writing. I was very involved in the uh, election in Minnesota of 1990. I uh, have about 30 TV shows that I commented on things over the two decades. I'm putting that in the form of a book. So I'm keeping busy. Uh, life is good. I, uh, you know, uh, there's a time and place for everything. And uh, there was a time for me to move on. And I was comfortable with that. But I really love my time on the court. Yeah. Well, you said you were a better judge uh, than you were a lawyer. What was your, what do I call it, um, your judicial philosophy um, to make that contribution? Well, uh, one thing is that I'm a generalist, okay? I started out in the practice of law as a generalist. And as the law practice in the United States has evolved, you got to be specialist. But the ultimate generalist in the... Uh, area of the law these days are the Supreme Court. We got everything, criminal law, civil law, all across the spectrum. And I love the challenge of that. I love that. There were, uh, I used to say that on the court, there were periods of time when I was uh, probably one of the world's top experts on a particular topic because it was involved in the case. Then I'd move on and I'd lose that. But also, uh, and it ties into what we're doing today, it gave me a platform to talk about the law, talk about the Constitution, and educate people about how the system works and how it should work. So I've been out and about Minnesota nationally, internationally, 
trying to explain how the law works, and that really has fit into who I am. Well, Minnesota, we've been reading a lot about Minnesota in the past uh, year or two, and I wonder if you could also answer this question. How has, how has Minnesota changed? I mean, from a legal point of view, well, from a sociological point of view, uh, since you were on the bench, it's it's different now, isn't it? It certainly seems different to the seems different to the the fellow who just follows national events. Uh, yes, it has. Now I will be. It's it's not patting ourselves on the back, but Minnesota is one of the best run states in the country. We have very little corruption here. Uh, the government works well. Many dedicated people, but. Uh, some of that has eroded over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, people have been uh, less kind to each other. Uh, they have been uh, less willing to uh, honor the principles of the rule of law. And so, uh, you know, democracy is an evolving concept and institution. And we're evolving in Minnesota. And I'm... Uh, I've never been so quite so displeased with the attitudes of some of my fellow Minnesota citizens as I am now. They uh, they they're too willing to abandon some of our basic principles and our institutions. I mean, I'm I'm working on trying to restore that. Good. I believe I believe that that's the duty of every lawyer and every judge. Ah, uh, so de Tocqueville. He says, exactly. you know, that the new aristocracy in America is not the wealthy or whatever. It's that you can find it at the uh, 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 judge's bench and the lawyer's bar. You're absolutely right about that. But what about Shakespeare, Judge? Shakespeare said, let's kill all the lawyers. First yeah, thing. But, yeah, but you've got to read you got to read the whole quote. You know, people who don't like lawyers just take that quote, that one part out. If you read the whole thing, he's quite complimentary about the role of lawyers in society. Okay. So now here you are trying to show American, showcase American justice, jurisprudence to the world. Um, but, you know, there are those who would say to you now today, Judge, uh, there's nothing much American jurisprudence can offer because uh, it's falling apart. Uh, and there are some cases that have been decided predictably. Um, by judges who predictably ruled the wrong way. And, and we need to take our judges to account also, and therefore our jurisprudence to account. Do you tell them this when you lecture in far off lands? I do. Now you're going to get me into something. That, I mean, when I talk about American law and jurisprudence, I focus on uh, the rule of law, uh, human rights, and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And now they're different documents. I tell people to look at the Declaration of Independence for philosophy and inspiration. That was written by basically five people, main author being uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson. I also tell people, I mean, I love the Constitution, okay? But I'm very candid that it is a defective document. It, uh, you know, if they say, if you like uh, sausage and uh, the law, you shouldn't watch either being made. Well, they made a lot of sausage in Philadelphia when they put our Constitution together, and it has a lot of defects. It, it, it uh, recognized uh, slavery. It has in it many ways in which you can perpetuate and support uh, legal discrimination. But the, the thing about the Constitution that's most important is it is, is for its ideals and the rule of law and humanity. And when I talk about our Constitution, I, I tell people, I, mean, I don't agree with the Scalia who said it's an original document, traditionalist, whether, no, it is a living document. It is the evolving document. And it gets interpreted by human beings. I particularly do not like the human beings, some of the human beings on our Supreme Court right now, because they, I don't think, could do a good job. They, they do not, in my mind, reflect many of the ideals, the common humanity, and the, some of the principles of rule of law in the Constitution. But 
then Robert's not going to let it go too far off the cliff. And uh, we'll come back from it. But the important thing is, is that that Constitution has the ideal of the rule of law the uh, and common humanity. And so, and it's uh, flexible enough so we can adjust to the times and evolve. See, uh, do you want me to give any example of how justices can go really wrong? Absolutely. Justice Scalia, not one of my favorite justices. <laughs> uh, he's uh, a little bit arrogant uh, to my mind. He's been a bit close mind, but he espoused this whole idea of uh, traditionalism and originalism. And is that he said that when he read, rendered his opinions, that's what he's doing. He's he is the purest of judges when looking at the Constitution because he's looking at original meat. Uh, I, 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 I there's a word I want to use here, but I won't use it because we're on. But he's way wrong because what Scalia's view is is that you're interpreting the words in the Constitution. He's saying he's originalist. He's seeing them the way he sees them. They're seeing him in the context of his experience, a very conservative Catholic, a very conservative political point of view. Now, I'm not sure that uh, if he were to go back and visit with uh, the uh, founders, they would say, well, Justice Scalia, you didn't get it quite right. And a good example would be the Heller case. We have a public health crisis in the United States with respect to guns. And it's very... Uh, really getting out of control when you say some things are out of control and i mean all these guns are a big factor not only the healthy nature of our citizens their fear but it also has an effect on policing you know when these police officers show up they're likely to, to find a gun well scalia wrote an opinion that basically said the constitution guarantees everybody the right to have a gun i mean he would give everybody a uh, AK-47 and a howitzer, whatever, guaranteed under the Constitution. No, the Constitution doesn't say that. I'm a big supporter of the Second Amendment. Every American citizen has the right to have a muzzle-loading rifle and a flintlock pistol as long as they guarantee that they will be part of a militia and available to put down a slave rebellion. There if he wants go. to be an originalist, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> lovely, lovely. <laughs> Well, you know, I always I always wondered why Ruth Bader Ginsburg was so friendly with Scalia, and and I felt I felt uh, at least part of me felt that she was friendly with him because she wanted to, uh, you know, change his views about things. Do you have a thought about that? Yeah, it's basically a mutual love for opera. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, you're, I mean, right. you're absolutely right. <laughs> there's there's some truth to that because when I was serving on a judge, and particularly as the chief judge of the Court of Appeals. There were multiple levels I dealt with my colleagues. One was administrative, one was on judicial issues we decided, and one was on a personal thing. And I always try to find something of a personal nature to keep a relation going because, you know, because you're right. She wanted to influence Scalia as much as she could. He's not very subject to influence, but she wanted to keep that rapport going uh, to make the court work well. So they had a mutual love. That's where they interacted on a personal level, their, their mutual love for uh, uh, opera. What do you think of that uh, case two weeks ago over the Arizona voter suppression um, statute? Uh, that was of great concern to a lot of people. Um, uh, and that was, uh, of course, the, um, uh, you know, the Republican majority on the court. I hate to say that, but that's what it was. Well, it is. Uh, it was 6-3. Yeah. And key was Roberts. Roberts does not like cases that deal with voting rights. And he does not like cases that deal with uh, 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 the uh, uh, reapportionment of districts. He will, he's just, that's his background. I haven't sorted out why it's so, but uh, he, he thinks that, uh, you know, states can do whatever they want to. Uh, 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 suppress the vote. Now, maybe he's right because originally the Constitution didn't allow women to vote, didn't allow non-property owners to vote. So maybe he's being an originalist saying is you've got the right to restrict uh, as uh, 
many people as you can from voting. He's wrong on that. I mean, I'm being a little facetious here, but they, they're just out of touch because the, one of the most fundamental principles of our democracy is the people are sovereign and they get to express their sovereignty by voting. They do it by uh, speaking, which is being able to show up, which is being restricted, and then being heard, which is uh, another thing that they're trying to do is to, even if you show up and vote, some of the Republicans are trying to restrict how the votes get counted. That is wrong. That is contrary to the basic ideals of uh, our Constitution. But unfortunately, uh, Roberts and the rest of them don't see it that way. That is unfortunate because it goes the wrong direction right now, especially right now, where we're in a voting crisis, if you will. Yeah. Uh, but let I me, mean, let I'm going go to gonna say here is that I have some expertise on this area. That's why I was in Tunisia and Libya and in the Philippines to talk about the right to vote, how you guarantee the right to show up and speak, and you guarantee the right to be heard. You know, Stalin said he didn't care who voted as long as he got to count, you know. <laughs> so let's let's go to China for a minute. I want to cover as many countries as we have time. But um, in China, um, you're going to be just as straightforward about that in discussing jurisprudence in China as you are here on the show. Um, what do you say to somebody in China who who is telling you that um, you know that seems inconsistent um, because you have you have all these high uh, high ideals. Uh, presumably embedded in the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and so forth, and yet the country doesn't follow them. At the end of the day, what the Supreme Court rules, what the president does, that is what the country is doing to its citizens, to its ideals. And so in China, when they criticize American jurisprudence, uh, what do you say? I mean, you, can you get away with saying, well, it's imperfect, that's what it is? Um, or, or do you have another answer? Well, one of the things I do is I tell them what my mother told me. You got to be careful when you point a finger at somebody because you're, in your hand, there are three fingers pointing right back at you. And so when uh, China is speaking about criticism of the United States, you have to be careful and measured in that criticism because uh, if you do, there are three fingers in that hand uh, pointing back at you. I mean, uh, China is an autocratic country ruled by the, uh, you know, Communist Party, the inner circle, and more and more powers being uh, 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 consolidated in President Xi. Uh, but I go back to what I said before. We are not perfect. But the important thing about our system is we have the ability to correct ourselves, to evolve. And, and, and in the United States, we have revolutions and we have a mechanism in the law and the Constitution that institutionalizes revolution. Those are elections every every two years. And I can point out, I mean, when Trump was elected in 2016, there was a revolution. When Obama beat Bush in 2008, there was a revolution at the voters in 2006. And then the Democrats took over Congress. There was a revolution. So we have the ability under our form of government to revolt and change things. Now, the important thing is here is that we got to get the sovereign entity here to do the right thing. That's the voter. And uh, there are some things going on in society that make that very difficult now. The Internet has made it difficult. The role of big money. The Supreme Court has just again said, you know, you don't have to disclose who the big money uh, donors are and do it. And uh, see, and our Supreme Court, I think, has made a mistake. It, it, it equates money with free speech. No, money is not free speech. Uh, but uh, my hope is, you know, a democracy is kind of like the pendulum on a grandfather's clock. You know, there is an appropriate arc in which that pendulum can go back and forth. You know, sometimes it's over here. I agree with it a lot. Sometimes it's over here. I don't agree. 
But as long as the pendulum is within that proper arc, we're going to be okay. Mm. Uh, it's when it goes outside of that arc. And I think it went outside of the arc with Trump. And we're going to have to bring that pendulum back into its proper level of swinging. Oh, wow. Some very important thoughts. Um, are you sure that uh, you don't want to be on the Supreme Court? Maybe a seat coming open, you know? Eh? No, I'm too old. <laughs> I mean, also, you, you must be reacting to some of this, and I would like your views about what the judge is saying and how it affects uh, America, uh, how it affects jurisprudence in America, and how it affects jurisprudence, for example, one example, in China. Well, Jay, um, I'm listening to all this um, weighty discussion. Uh, maybe it's beyond my pay grade, but however, let me take a stab at it. You know, there's a saying by Kofi Annan said, good, healthy, democratic societies are built on three pillars, peace and stability, economic development, and respect for rule of law and human rights. The first thing, peace and stability, that's why I guess Biden is trying to get out, bring the troops back home. You need peace and stability. Uh, America has been at and, war. And to bring some of that focus back to the United States to deal with some of our internal problems and instability. That, that's correct. And economic development, you know, putting that money that goes out into uh, our militaries around the world, bring them back, put infrastructure development. We need high-speed trains that connect uh, Boston, New York to Topeka, Kansas, and out to uh, the Rockies. And we need all of that because, you know, this is where America has neglected itself. <clears throat> you know, part of being a democratic society is you got to share that economic development across the country. And one of the things is... Um, uh, a, a good thing about China that I've been there 50 over 50, 20 years is that um, they got the high speed rail. So the high speed train stops at every small little city and people in the small cities can go on the Internet. They can sell their things and they're taken from small cities to the big cities, to bigger markets. So we need to tie this up. So that's part of the part of this whole thing of this where we're discussing a democratic society. And the third. Oh, pillar, did, yes. you, did you read uh, Biden's bill on infrastructure? I, I, I'm going through that. <laughs> uh, we absolutely need infrastructure, something we've ignored terribly. We've ignored that, Paul. And that's part of what I see taking back from China to the U.S., where they've got it down. They've, they've got the part of being economic development. They've got peace and stability. They don't go to wars, except they're getting a little bit edgy now. And the third, uh, and economic development also means um, that's why Biden is trying to get the Internet to a lot of the rural communities in America. And that's so important. We can't there's neglect a, There's people. another important factor here. I mean, uh, the, the wealth needs to be spread around. And the Republicans are promoting policies that uh, uh, concentrate wealth in a few, an oligarchy. And, uh, and that way, you have fewer and fewer people that feel invested in their form of government. And so that's a very dangerous development. China has a bit of a better road because they're on the way up. They're bringing so many people out of poverty. You know, it's, uh, people are saying, gee, it sure looks good to me because I'm better off than I was, you know. And there are many people, this is the Trump thing, people are saying, well, I'm not as well off as I should be or what my parents were. And that's one of the tensions and problems that we're dealing with here. And that that's correct, uh, Justice Sanderson. And, and getting... And it's like I'm saying is, you know, economic development also means that infrastructure. It means uh, everybody having internet. It means um, that um, everyone has access to a smartphone, uh, affordable uh, phone plans. When you're paying a uh, hundred bucks a month for a phone plan, you're locked in a contract for several years. You're not going to afford it. In the law, it's called a contract of adhesion. Contract you have of adhesion. no choice but to sign it if you want the service. That, that's correct. And then getting back to, Jay, like what like Justice Anderson said, and I believe that there's 10 percent of America that owns 80 percent of the assets and wealth in this country. And that's shocking. And this is the same. That's uh, They're not redistributing their wealth. So uh, that's why you have a lot of disgruntled Americans. And the third thing, what, what Justice Anderson is working By the on way, is the rule of law. Biden wants to redistribute it. And one of the way we redistribute is through taxes. To taxes, yes. And so, I mean, he, the, when he says he wants to impose taxes on the wealthy, it's very much a political philosophy that we need to redistribute the wealth in this country if it's going to be uh, uh, sound and secure in the future. 
Yes, and that's correct. So that's the second pillar, economic development. The third pillar is the respect for rule of law and human rights. And and I think that uh, what we've seen in the last four years through the Trump presidency, the January 6th insurrection, uh, shows me that there are some chinks in this respect for rule of law. Okay, and, 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 and again, uh, all of this means that in America, this uh, called uh, you know we, our democratic side. It's 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 like on the pendulum, Paul. What what you've yeah. talked about, the pendulum is swinging, and as we swing, we're trying to make the corrections. Yeah. So, but it, it it also loops back to the professor's original question of me: How have things changed? And you put your finger on one of the ways it's changed. There is a diminished respect for the rule of law and the institutions that uh, support that concept. And, and so, so so here you are, Judge, and uh, I'm picking Libya because you said Libya was problematic for you. Um, and you're, you're addressing a bunch of lawyers or judges or ordinary citizens in Libya, maybe political rulers, political officials. Um, and you're telling them about American jurisprudence and your view of it. And I, I, you're a terrific ambassador. You, if, yeah, I'd love to be with you when you make these trips and uh, enjoy the moment of contact. And I see the moment of contact as something like uh, the Sistine Chapel. You know that, that painting? Oh, yeah, the picture of the, the yeah, fingers the, coming together. Fingers coming together. So here you are. Uh, Paul Anderson connecting with people, ideally in Libya and and various other countries, and you are telling them, you know, from your heart, uh, what the United States stands for, what law in the United States stands for. How much influence do you have on them? Okay, are you connecting, like in the Sistine Chapel, or is it just going over their heads or around their backs? No, for the most part, I think I'm connecting. And I think one of the reasons being they they appreciate my candor and honesty when I talk about American system and jurisprudence. I said, I'm going to describe to you the ways we do things in the United States. It's a system of government that has evolved over two centuries. But what I want to make sure that you understand is you do not want to adopt what we're doing, lock, stock and barrel. What your job here today is to listen to me and figure out what parts of what I say will work for you. To, uh, cause, and I say that democracy comes in many shapes and forms. So our form of democracy is not an end-all and be-all. But I say that a respect for human rights and equality and the rule of law is absolutely fundamental to any uh, democracy. So take a look at what I say. To try and digest what we are doing in the United States. And then pick and choose. What works for you? You know, you have a different structure. You have a tribal background. You have a religious background. I remember sitting in Tunisia and uh, we were going over their constitution. And the first line is that <clears throat> we are an Islamic republic. You know, and what does that mean? Does that mean that you're going to use uh, only Islamic law? Well, Tunisia didn't interpret it that way. But, you know, uh, uh, you, you need to pick and choose and see what I mean. But they needed to have that in there if they were going to get acceptance of the Constitution. But then, you know, it, to some people it meant one thing, to others it meant. And Tunisia's done, relatively speaking, a decent job coming out of April spring. Not perfect, but okay. What, what went wrong in, uh, in uh, Libya? Well, you know, I was I met with Ambassador Stevens. He was a wonderful person. And, uh, you know, he saved over uh, tens of thousands of lives. But, uh, well, gosh, there's so many things. Uh, when Gaddafi was defeated, uh, he had many arms and he had uh, uh, mercenaries, many of them from uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So much of his arms went south. That's why we had this problem in uh, Nigeria. They they got so much arms out of uh, out of uh, Libya. But then there was a failure to understand and appreciate the tribal nature of Libyan society. You have a tribal, multiple tribe, but you have the area of Benghazi, and then you have uh, uh, to, uh, Tripoli, and then you have Sub-Saharan, and uh, very different agendas, different approaches, 
and uh, laid over the top of that was is that you have the uh, Islamic fundamentalists who come in and want to take over various aspects of it for their own particular purposes. And it just was uh, kind of beyond the understanding of the people who are trying to get a control of it. Yeah. And well, then, you know, by I, the I, way, then you, then you have Russia, because Russia you know, told the United States, you get involved in these things, don't do any regime change. Well, uh, you know, Gaddafi was cornered in a hole in some place, and uh, there was regime change, and so Russia didn't like it, and so they started messing in there. It's a complicated world, and it's hard to connect the dots, but one thing that seems clear right now is um, despite mm, the beacon of, uh, or maybe the previous beacon, the, the former beacon of hope and charity, of uh, immigration openness and the like that the United States has rep represented, and still does represent in many places to varying degrees, um, we have a bunch of countries that are sliding back into a state of nature to become failed states. I think, you know, the most, uh, the most recent example of that is Haiti. Um, it's, um, you know, there was an article in the New York Times by some, some Haitian person who was describing life in Haiti right now, and it's a failed state right now. Yeah. Um, there are many in Africa, we know that. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, uh, Syria. Question, Syria. Syria, is, yes, you saw 60 Minutes example. last night. It was horrible, horrible in, in Syria. And so the question I put to you is, you know, how can you remain optimistic? How can you remain, uh, you know, a, a, a purveyor of American idealism? Because that's what it is. Um, when so many places in the world are, are degenerating and, and being fragmented and, 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 and becoming failed states. Simple answer. I have no choice but to be. Uh, optimistic and hopeful. Uh, John Reed talked about uh, uh, uncertainty and the uncertainty of the future. Uh, but uh, that uncertainty breeds hopefulness because that means that uh, we have control over the future. I mean, our, the headlights of our car only see so far down the road, but there's a lot of road in front of that. It's uncertain, but I'm hopeful. And so that's why I do what I do. Uh, try to, you know, spread the word of, you know, democracy, rule of law, and hope that uh, it will uh, gather force in various places. And it has in some. I mean, it's 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 a it's a bad time now, and I, I mean, and it's hard. Oh, it's so hard to stay optimistic and hopeful. But as I said earlier, I have no choice. That's the way I have to be. Russell, what a fabulous guest you brought to us today. A man who is not only accomplished, but honest and visionary. I'm so happy to spend a few moments together with you guys. Hey, it's Russell, been can, fun. Russell, can you close and give us, uh, you know, your reactions and your thoughts going forward on this discussion? A summary, if you will. I think what I've got from this, um, our conversation today really is a couple, two things. Is One is evolving. We have to understand things are evolving. The American um, our democratic institution is evolving. Lots of things are going to be happening. And there's a lot of things that may make throw the monkey's wrench and we get very depressed. But as Justice Anderson says, Judge Anderson said, there's hope. We have to have hope. There's no choice. And if we focus on that beam of light, that hope, We'll make it through the darkness, and we'll find a way through this road. Uh, and it's it's just a matter of time. So, can I add yeah. one final thought? Sure, please. Democracies are fragile. It's a fragile form of government, and to sustain themselves to endure, it takes hard work. So, my urging is for the people listening to it: get out and do that hard work. It's good. It preserves this form of government based on the rule of law and common humanity. Judge Justice Paul Anderson, I, I I wish we're related. At some level, I feel we are. Uh, and I really appreciate you coming on the show. I appreciate everything you've said. Russell, again, thank you so much for bringing the judge to us. Hey, thank uh, you for thank you for having me on. 
Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.